Okay. Okay, so uh, welcome at our weekly seminar. Today we have Bernard Schulz. He's currently a deputy director of uh, Sophie, for Sophia Science Mission uh, Operations at NASA Ames, and he's also affiliated with Deutsche Sophia Institute, uh, University of Stuttgart. Uh, he did his PhD in 1993 at Max Planck Institute for Astronomy. Uh, then he moved to ESA, uh, where he worked on uh, one of the instruments on the infrared space observatory. Uh, then he uh, was, uh, for quite some time, he was senior staff for Herscher space, space mission. Uh, and then finally at Peter Science Center for, I think, a year and a half. So uh, today Bernard will tell us about Sophia. And I would say that many astronomers, uh, when they get telescope time, they're not only interested in telescope time, but also the frequent flyer miles that they gain for each travel they do to the observatory. Uh, with Sophia, I think it's quite different. Even though the observatory is in the plane, you don't get any frequent flyer miles. So Bernard, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, well, I'm afraid uh, frequent flyer miles is, is actually something you cannot get on a flight with Sophia. Because uh, as I'm going to show you later, we are taking off where we also land afterwards. So um, the, the net distance is zero. <laughs> OK, I'm, uh, so I, I, without further ado here, I want to, I want to just uh, uh, let you enjoy this nice plane of our, uh, uh, this nice image of our plane observatory. Um, these are these are fascinating uh, pictures some of our staff are taking and um well uh, i want to uh, tell you um a little bit about infrared first and why do we care why is it interesting i'm going to introduce our observatory uh talk a little bit uh, about science highlights so the science that we actually do um and then instrumentation um Ultimately, uh, I hope that some of you are toying with the idea of uh, writing a proposal for Sophia and actually observing with it. So I'm going to describe how these observations are uh, performed and uh, also how you can actually write proposals, what you need and uh, what the deadlines are and so forth. So um, infrared was originally known as radiant heat. Um, they already appear in the literature, uh, you know, before 1800, but uh, typically William, Sir William Herschel is credited with uh, discovering them. Uh, truth is he discovered them in the solar spectrum. Um, but that was, of course, a very important uh, point, and I think you all know this famous experiment where he put uh, thermometers in a, uh, a solar spectrum and measured uh, temperature increase also outside below the red. Now, this is what we call now infrared light, and it takes up uh, quite a large part of the spectrum. Um, Unfortunately, it is uh, absorbed by our uh, atmosphere. So the atmosphere, as you can see here, is, is actually a problem for astronomers, except for the visible light, which is uh, going all the way through. And this is why we have our eyes uh, sensitive in that uh, range. Uh, only long wavelengths, radio waves reach the ground and uh, a little bit of the infrared, but that's pretty much it, right? So this part here is hard to observe from the ground. Now, why do we care? Uh, first of all, one interesting thing about infrared is um, it has reduced extinction. So uh, it goes through dust clouds where visible light is blocked. Uh, which allows us, for instance, to see the uh, galactic center and, and do fascinating things there. 
So um, that's one of them. Dust transparency is really a good thing there. And then uh, also dust emission. Anything that has a temperature emits infrared radiation, even when it's very cold, like this uh, uh, interstellar dust here uh, that we see on that uh, picture of Orion. Uh, left is visible and on the right is infrared. I think these are IRAS data. And uh, it's, it's quite amazing what you can see there. So everything that uh, is hidden and dark actually emits and becomes luminous in the infrared. Um, now here, this is pretty much the bread and butter of what Sophia does. Um, there, is, there, there are many spectral lines. Uh, you, you see here, this is a, um, gives you an idea of, of the overall spectrum and on the on the right here, you see all these uh, 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 lines that can be used as good diagnostic for the interstellar medium in particular, and a lot of things you can do there. And last but not least, there's something that is has been pioneered a lot by uh, Sophia. Uh, this is uh, uh, polarized dust emission, which allows us to uh, measure magnetic fields. This is where um, slightly elongated particles, dust particles, are aligned with the magnetic field. They, they circle and uh, you know, they self-emit. And uh, because of their elongated shape, this uh, emission is polarized. So um, this all allows us to address quite some fundamental questions, and uh, this is by no means complete what I'm showing here, but um, the, yeah, where do we come from? This is, uh, this is one of these things where you say, okay, what, how, how did this all form here? And how do solar systems form? How are stars born? And um, uh, one of the newer questions really is uh, what we're still grappling with is, what regulates the collapse of the interstellar medium? So when, when a big cloud uh, collapses and uh, forms stars, that happens on time scales that are currently not well explained. And uh, this is one of the major uh, fields of research of SOFIA. There are more, but nevertheless, let me um, just show you here what the observatory looks like. Um, SOFIA is a modified 747 SP aircraft. Uh, it contains a 2.7 meter uh, telescope. Um, this is a joint program between the US and Germany at 80 to 20% uh, contribution. It provides a unique far infrared access uh, from five to about 320 micron for the astronomical community. It flies up to 13.7 kilometers, 45,000 feet above most of the water vapor in the atmosphere. And uh, it, uh, it, we, we have a suite of infrared images, spectrometers and polarimeters that we can mount uh, at the telescope. It's operated by NASA, DLR, and then USRA on the US side and DSI on the German side. These are contractors basically that uh, do most of the uh, operations. The regular science operation began in 2017. Uh, Sophia has a design lifetime of 20 years. And uh, well, uh, this is how the aircraft looks in a cutout here. So uh, we have uh, the main cabin. This is where the uh, Astronomers sit, the, the mission directors, the instrument operators, the telescope operators. So all of this happens here. We also have a console for outreach. So we have sometimes teachers who, who fly with us and uh, then uh, tell their experience in the classroom. Uh, also, we have here science crew stations. And uh, this, is, this is actually where uh, people do already pre-reduction of their data. So this all is kind of like a pipeline. And here is the bulkhead. This is where the uh, telescope is actually uh, sitting, uh, resting in, on, the, on this, with its weight on this bulkhead. 
the telescope itself is over here, but the whole thing is like a scale. So there's a counterweight here, which actually is the science instrument. So all of this is nicely in balance. Um, here are some pictures I took uh, a while ago in New Zealand. So this is how it looks inside. It looks like Star Trek. Uh, uh, you know, there's a telescope with the great instrument. So this is the view towards the back. Um, here is the, this is actually the great instrument team. Um, and <clears throat> this is the cockpit. We had some beautiful Aurora Australis uh, out there. And uh, this was just, uh, it could take some nice pictures. Here the pilots posing with the Aurora. This was uh, quite nice. Um, here, this is the telescope operator console. So there are two telescope operators who uh, work uh, the telescope, make sure it's pointing the right uh, place. And as I said, the pre preliminary data reduction is here. Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, the telescope is, uh, you know, in, in perfect balance. This here is the bulkhead and it is kind of sitting on there in this gigantic uh, bearing. Um, this is the contribution from Germany to Sophia. It's uh, not the only contribution, but this is the major contribution. Um, 2.7 meter mirror, 2.5 meter of that is are illuminated because you know you 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 don't want to uh, have your instrument observe the rim here, which is of course radiating brightly in the infrared. Um, in particular, when you're doing things like chopping. Um, 17 metric tons is the uh, installed weight of this telescope. So that's quite something uh, that we're lifting up into the stratosphere. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this observatory allows us to uh, look at a, a number of uh, interesting features, in particular CO lines. We, we see the dust continuum fine structure light, hydrides, HD, NHV, PAHs, water. While water is a little bit more difficult because of course uh, we still have a, a residual atmosphere and so uh, that contains water as well. And so these, these observations are still a little bit more difficult, but we, um, in particular when uh, by redshift and high spectral resolution, uh, our, ob our object uh, has a different speed than uh, the earth then we can nicely distinguish them. And there's a whole number of uh, physics uh, themes that we can address with this. Now, let me show you a few science highlights. Here, the, probably the most, most famous one we, we are quite proud of is uh, the discovery of uh, helium hydride in space. This was uh, the first molecule, uh, at least one of the first molecules that were formed after the Big Bang. Um, this molecule, of course, what we saw was not the first molecule, but uh, there were conditions in planetary nebula predicted to be right for its formation today. And it had never been seen in space. So this uh, was a very nice um, discovery. And of course, it allows you then to refine things like reaction rates and so forth and get a better picture of what happened uh, after the Big Bang. Um, Sophia is always, uh, because it is still uh, within the atmosphere, so the sensitivity is limited compared to the space mission, and, and people say always, yeah, but you cannot do uh, faint things like uh, high redshift galaxies and so forth. Well, it's not entirely true. You can do some of it. And here's, for instance, an example of a, uh, a gravitational lens starburst galaxy. And that's at uh, Z uh, 1.03. And we can, uh, you can then look at um, the, the SED. And uh, in this case, you can constrain the fraction uh, of the AGN contribution, which in this case was not very big. But um, anyway, you can answer these kind of questions. Um, of course, uh, within our galaxy, the you know the sources are brighter and this is uh, easier to do for Sophia. Uh, here is an example. This is a uh, map of the Orion Nebula um, at uh, 158 micron. This is the so-called uh, C plus line. Uh, we did this with a great instrument at very high spectral resolution, and this way we can 
uh, get all the uh, different velocities. And because this is, uh, these are expanding bubbles here, um, this gives you an idea about the geometry. So effectively, the, um, the wavelength becomes a Z dimension. So you have, you get a, a three dimensional impression. Um, what is also notable, the mapping speed of uh, Sophia is about a factor of 50 faster than Herschel. Herschel had the hi-fi instrument, which was groundbreaking at the time. Uh, it already uh, observed C plus, but um, uh, of course technology carries on. And uh, so, and the nice thing about Sophia is you can put in the newest technology. So this way we uh, have these advances uh, possible. So um, there's a, a feedback legacy program. We have legacy programs that um, uh, try to observe larger chunks and uh, this way um, uh, allow also for archival research. We have uh, um, all of the um, data of Sophia is in the URSA archive uh, at IPAC. And uh, you can basically, if you, if you have larger consistent data sets, then archival research becomes easier. And we have something like this here in the legacy program, which uh, studies massive stellar feedback in, in star forming regions. Um, uh, other legacy programs are uh, in the pipe. So what we do is we, uh, um, if, if a legacy program is uh, proposed and uh, found interesting, then usually we do a pilot. And here, this is an example of a pilot uh, observation program, where, which just receives a few hours, so kind of 10 or so, um, at the beginning to, to check whether the, the whole program is sound. And then uh, once it is uh, considered to be fine, then the, the total complement will be uh, observed. And that is more. These are then typically 100 hours over two years or so um, of that order. Um, PDRs are uh, another important topic of, uh, that is being studied with Sophia. Um, so these are uh, photon dominated regions where you have an ionized site on one side and, uh, and a less excited si uh, site on the other. And uh, again, we have uh, we have these fine structure lines that we can observe here. And uh, that gives us a very good idea uh, of the structure of these uh, areas. Um, here is an example of uh, extragalactic uh, astronomy we do with FIFI LS, which is uh, an instrument uh, spectrometer at lower spectral resolution. Um, that allows you to trade uh, spectral resolution for uh, sensitivity, and this is how you can do extragalactic work. This here uh, studies the NO abundance and uh, the NO ratio, and uh, which gives you an idea about the uh, star formation history in galaxies. And uh, one important thing to notice is, of course, in the infrared, you have very little extinction, so uh, your results about star formation rates and so forth are uh, less effective <laughs> and you don't need to correct so much for it and uh, it is less error prone in that respect. Um, now here is this is of course uh, this nice uh, uh, thing we can do with Sophia which is uh, looking at uh, magnetic fields through polarization. Um, here we have M82, for instance, <clears throat> where it turns out that the field lines are nicely aligned with the outflow. And uh, if you look top down on a galaxy, here's this other uh, example of NGC 1068, there we find that the magnetic field lines are all aligned with the spiral arms. Um, there's a whole legacy program about this also in progress. Um, already a few nice papers were uh, written about that. And here are these amazing images that you can um, study. Now, uh, even in our galaxy, of course, we can uh, look at that as well. And our galactic center shows uh, <clears throat> polarized uh, uh, emission as well. Um, again, here we, we have uh, 
quite a number of questions uh, that that arose. Actually, we, we wanted to answer questions, but of course, as, as usual, we get more. And uh, one of the interesting ones is really, okay, how far does the magnetic field here uh, uh, control the infall of matter into our galactic center, into the supermassive black hole there? That is uh, still not clear, but uh, people are working on the models. And of course, magnetic field modeling is uh, still a little bit in its infancy. The theory is, uh, is complicated and uh, um, I think we, we still have to work a lot on that part. Magnetic fields are also, of course, suspected to uh, <clears throat> be responsible for uh, uh, the, the slower in matter infall during star formation. And you probably know about the uh, filaments that were seen by Herschel. And of course, we can observe those too with Sophia. And uh, we can look at the magnetic fields. Or, um, and there was a nice nature paper also uh, that uh, explained a little bit about uh, you know, how, the, uh, how the matter flows along the uh, field lines uh, towards uh, the mass centers, uh, you know, proto planets, uh, sorry, proto stars. And then uh, um, once the gravitation uh, takes over, you find matter also fl uh, uh, flowing at right angles towards magnetic fields. Um, water on the moon was a, was a big deal uh, recently. Um, the, the, you know, we, we always knew that there was a, uh, an OH uh, uh, line we could observe at something that was close to three micron. Um, uh, several uh, satellites did that also, but um, the 6.1 micron feature, that is really the, distinct, the distinction where uh, you can um, uh, distinguish uh, water from, from hydrides. And uh, here we had this uh, opportunity to, to see an unambiguous water signature on the moon. So there is water, not a lot at all, but there is. And uh, this, of course, is important for any future moon landing uh, enterprises. Uh, last but not least here, this is uh, the Pluto occultation, which we observed in 2015. This was a pretty complex operation. They needed to go exactly to the center of the shadow. And this is of course a cool thing about Sophia, you can actually move your telescope. And they did this so well that they uh, saw the central flash in the light curve here which happens when you're exactly in the, in the center of the shadow and you have this kind of um, glow of the atmosphere of the, of the planet. Um, and this is, of course, glow in uh, starlight of this obscured star here that, that happened there. Well, um, so let's see what instruments do we have. Um, so there is, uh, there's, for FPR plus, this is the focal plane imager. This is a visible uh, visual camera, but which was used in this case here for the Pluto observations. Um, we use it as uh, mainly as a guide camera, but it can be used for science as well. Uh, forecast and axis are our mid infrared instruments. Forecast is a camera, but also has uh, grisms. And then axis is the really high resolution uh, spectrometer um, that, uh, that we have and, and which runs between four and a half and 28 micron. Hawk plus, so all the three instruments down here are the far infrared instruments. Hawk plus is the camera. This is the one that makes these uh, beautiful polarization images. Um, it can be used as a normal uh, uh, photometer camera, but also a, as a uh, for polarization. DVLS is a intermediate spectral resolution spectrometer. Uh, that means it it has a, a still a good sensitivity to also do extragalactic work. Extragalactic work is a little bit harder with great, but uh, you know great is this very high resolution heterodyne instrument that allows you uh, to do many dynamic studies where it is particularly successful. And if, in fact, actually the great instrument is, the, is currently considered to be the most successful instrument on SOFIA. 
Um, um, yeah, we are really quite happy about that. So in uh, resolving power wavelength space, this is where these instruments are located. So FDI plus here, of course, visible light and uh, it has, it's a photometric camera. Access here is very interesting because of its high spectral resolution. Forecast prisms and forecast camera are here. PFLS there, uh, Hawk plus has its filters down here is of course no not much spectral resolution and then great with this enormous spectral resolution that uh, is distributed over here and then you can see also there's complementarity to alma all of these here which i marked are unique capabilities and that is, uh, is quite important to know uh, because there's always this talk about sophia oh yeah it's so it's so expensive and it is um uh, we, we, you know, we should do something else, but um, this is actually something uh, one should think about because uh, these are unique abilities, we will lose them all, and uh, the next infrared mission or so is not even on the horizon anymore. Um, so this is, this is my pitch here about Sophia's uniqueness, and uh, it, uh, it has a lot of uh, um, things that you can do with it. Um, access to the mid infrared, infrared. It's uh, an inertial platform up there that uh, even allows you uh, observations of uh, Venus, for instance. So we just did Venus, uh, um, I think, last week. And uh, yeah, and then, of course, it gives you worldwide access. We can go to the south uh, during the uh, northern summer months where the uh, troposphere is higher. So we go into the winter and uh, observe there. Um, we have a 20 year design uh, lifetime and it allows us even temporal studies in that respect. And uh, yeah, and then of course you can put new instrumentation on there. And that uh, is, a, is a whole new thing. Um, here, this is a um, timeline of uh, infrared instrumentation and as you see we had the golden age let's I, I call that around here it started with ISO and then we had Spitzer and Herschel, Arkari, Weiss and so forth and so forth we had um, all of these fascinating instruments and uh, now there is not much left JWST is always touted as oh yeah this is the next uh, infrared instrument uh, I'm very happy when JWST is up but uh, we also have to appreciate that it stops uh, before 30 microns. So all this far infrared part here, which is uh, also a large part of the spectrum, is still not covered by anything. And since speaker and uh, OST are not going to happen now, as we know, um, we, we, have to, we have to think very hard what we do in this area. So observing with Sophia, um, there's an annual proposal call. Um, so this timeline was a little bit different, but because of COVID, we extended the cycle nines by a quarter year. So now things are all at different times. Um, we just had a call issued and the proposal deadline is uh, end of January. So I encourage you all to uh, think about proposals and send them in. Um, the cycle start then is beginning of October of the following year. It's a two-phase uh, process. First, uh, there's a science justification and a technical feasibility check. And uh, once this is, of course, the most important part because this is where your proposal gets uh, graded and accepted or not. And then once it is accepted, there's, uh, it goes into phase two for the detailed observation definition. Um, there is a dual anonymous review for the USQ. Actually, that's already in the phase one. Um, that is something just to keep in mind. Um, so you, you need to write your proposals in, in the right way. Um, we can only mount one instrument on the plane. Of course, the FBI plus is always there. This is our guide camera, but uh, otherwise you can only have one instrument there. So uh, these are service mode observations. You are uh, allowed or even encouraged to fly with us uh, when the observation is on, but it is not absolutely necessary. However, it has some advantages because you can still interact with the team and 
you know, if something doesn't work out, you might have a plan B what to observe uh, better. And then the data are pro uh, pipeline processed at the Science Center and, and sent to you uh, via the archive at, uh, at IPEC. Uh, we have a few limitations when we observe. This is uh, the, um, the aircraft and, you know, we have this uh, big hole in there. Um, so we can uh, uh, steer the telescope in elevation nicely, 23 to 558 degrees gives you uh, quite a range. But of course, in the other direction, we are limited. Uh, and so we have to turn the airplane in the right direction in order to observe a specific uh, object. Now, um, that leads, of course, to certain interesting flight paths. Um, here you, uh, so on, on the right here, this is the American uh, uh, West Coast. So this is the Pacific. And we, our plane is located in Palmdale, which is uh, quite close to Los Angeles, just on the other side of a mountain range. Uh, so we take off here and uh, climb and then uh, set up the telescope. So, but in order to do that, we, we of course, we have certain objects to look at. And, uh, here, this is, for instance, a Mars leg. So Mars was in this direction. Uh, sorry, no, Mars was, no, I have to think. Um, Mars was on the other side, okay. Uh, so Mars was here. And uh, so it also curves a little bit because of course the earth rotates and we have to follow the object. Here, the antennae galaxies and so forth. So all of this, gives us a, a lot of constraints. And in the end, you also want to land again where you started. So this puts um, quite some constraints on, uh, on your flight planning. Uh, we are nominally in Palmdale, as I said. In summer, we are in Christchurch uh, in New Zealand um, for a, a certain period. At the moment, we, uh, we had to come up with different solutions because New Zealand was close to us. So for during COVID times, we, uh, we just did, um, went to Tahiti, which was an interesting experience. But um, in the end, we also had to flee there because of rising COVID rates. And now we are looking into the possibility of uh, Santiago de Chile, uh, which is anticipated for uh, spring. Um, so scheduling constraints, we, we have special use areas uh, the, that we mess, must avoid. Mexico doesn't give us uh, overflight rights and some other areas we need to avoid too. Our flights are typically 10 hours, eight hours of, uh, for sh so-called short flights. We have those sometimes in particular in summer. Um, and uh, you know, only a certain part of this is actually usable for science. So we, we lose some time to climb and some time to land. Um, in order to uh, minimize the impact of the residual water vapor, we need to climb as high as we can. At the beginning of the flight, we are still heavy with, the, with the, all the fuel and we climb uh, slowly as the, uh, as the plane gets lighter. Um, yeah, so uh, also a lot of the targets that we look at are clumped in the inner galaxy. So there are some uh, trade-offs that we also have to do here because everybody is fighting for the same areas on the sky, but eventually we have to return. So we need to find targets also on the other side. So that makes it always adventurous. Um, our scheduling is, uh, well, our, our overall schedule is uh, determined at the uh, end of the time allocation committee meeting when the time allocation committee gives us the, the, the grades of the proposals. Then we can look at uh, the high level schedule, where in the year will be the different instruments located, and then uh, where is the maintenance interval and where our uh, southern deployments. So all of this has to be strategically placed, and then we run software that tries then to uh, put all the observing targets in such a way together that we can construct uh, flights that return home in a, in a most uh, efficient way and uh, without so-called dead legs. Um, once all of this is done, then we have an overall schedule and then 
uh, about 10 weeks before the start of the series with a certain instrument, we uh, do the final flight planning. This is where our uh, flight planners get really, really busy. And they have to finish this about six weeks before the first flight. And uh, yeah, and then uh, on that time scale, also invitations to uh, observers will be sent out who want to fly with us. So, um, but yes, there, there is a little bit of uncertainty in all this. And the um, here, this is just an impression how the schedule uh, of our observatory looks. So here, for instance, this, uh, this was a New Zealand deployment. So this was a ferry flight to New Zealand. Then uh, we have here um, uh, uh, the different instrument campaigns. So all of these color, colored uh, days here, each box is a day. Uh, these are actual flights. And then in between there are doubt times, uh, rests. And uh, here's the long maintenance phase and so forth. So now I suppose, uh, I hope that some of you want to uh, write proposals. In order to do that, you go to our data cycle system. That is, uh, um, this is a place on the web where we originally also housed all the data. Uh, there was a data archive. This has now moved to URSA. And uh, if you want to do any archive research, then I urge you to go to URSA, not here. Um, but here is still uh, the home of all the proposal development tools. In particular, there's something called USPOT, which is, is a piece of software that uh, we, um, uh, well, it comes originally from Spitzer, uh, was reused for, by Herschel, and uh, Sophia is also using it as a very nice suite of uh, uh, software that allows you, you know, planning and so forth. and. Uh, this is an impression here how uh, the windows look. You can put your proposal in there. You define your observations in there. And actually, you need to do this already to some extent for your initial proposal, because you already have to tell what you're actually going to observe and how you're going to do this. Um, there are also possibilities then to visualize everything. Um, everything is done very similar to the space operations. You know, if you if you have experience with Herschel, for instance, or so, then, then this uh, looks familiar to you, or Spitzer. Um, anyway, uh, you, you have to predefine already uh, a few things. There are uh, time estimators for the instrument uh, uh, performance uh, that you can find on that website as well. And uh, you, you use those in order to determine sensitivities. Um, an important point actually is uh, atmospheric opacity. So um, <laughs> the, you know, the, we, we still have a residual atmosphere and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, we, we have a limiting altitude, which, uh, which limits us in, in certain respects. And here's, a, you know, here's a, a example where you have the O1 line, that's the rest wavelength here. And uh, depending on you know how the Doppler effect works for you, you can be completely extinguished, or you can have a have a nice transparency of the atmosphere. So this all has to be planned very carefully, and our flight planners are also aware of these things. So um, you know this is this is part of the game uh, that you that you have to play here in order to make successful observations. Um, we, we have the tools in order to um, uh, care for that. Okay, one other uh, point here just is um, just in terms of strategy. Um, there are, so we actually publish these also, uh, there are complementary sky positions. I, as, I, as I explained before, we always want to, we want to come back. That means if we have some targets on one side of the flight path, then we need to have targets on the opposite flight path. And uh, that means uh, because there are certain targets like the Galactic Center or Orion, they, they, everybody wants to go there and do observations there. But the opposite uh, side is then uh, an area where we would like also to have targets. And that um, favors these in a way because you might even with a lower grade proposal 
uh, you may still be lucky to get uh, uh, positions observed there just because they are needed. And you can, in particular, surveys, uh, survey proposals will be uh, um, quite successful here. Yeah. Um, so our call for proposals is uh, out. It was released. There is a US call and there's a German call. Uh, the US call is open for everybody. So that does not only include the US community, but everybody uh, here on the planet. And you can, uh, uh, you can propose there. Of course, you have to compete then with uh, a large number of uh, 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 other scientists. So uh, the German call is for 20% of the time. Um, that is only for uh, individuals who are affiliated with uh, uh, German institutions. So nationality is not the point, it's the affiliation that counts here. Um, there will be a uh, update of the call around 10th of December, and the proposals are due uh, on the 28th uh, Pacific time or on the 29th in the morning uh, Central European time. We anticipate the announcement of selections around May 22, and then the cycle period starts at uh, 1st of October 22 and goes for a year. As I said, there is, um, there's US calls and there's a German call. The US issues actually two calls. So the regular observing cycle call, but then also a call for legacy science programs. These legacy science programs are typically in the order of 50 to 100 hours or so. And uh, of course, all have to be justified. And they are um, big chunks. You need to assemble probably a you know a good consortium of scientists also, so that you can also um, demonstrate that you can actually do something uh, with that data in a in a reasonably good time. There is uh, there are a number of important links here that I just wanted to highlight. There's the U.S. call. There's a legacy call. And the German call, these are all on these uh, different websites. Um, you can go and subscribe to mailing lists if you want to stay up to date in what is going on. There is, of course, also the proposal uh, development site, the calculators. And uh, I also wanted to uh, say here, there's, we have a science brochure that is out now. You can find it on the website. Um, and uh, that also contains a lot of uh, uh, science um, examples that Sophia has uh, accomplished. And I think this is where I want to stop um, and uh, open for questions. Okay, thank you a lot. Now we have time for questions. So first, at our audience, uh, I'll repeat. So, so the question is, what's this uh, oversubscription rate for the proposals and how many are accepted? Good question. Um, so the oversubscription rate is typically in the, in the order of five on the US side. On the German side is a little bit lower, more like uh, two and a half or so. It, it varies also from cycle to cycle, but um, yeah. And in terms of number of proposals, um, we range in, okay, I, um, this is just a ballpark number, but um, uh, we are talking about 100, 150 proposals overall that, that may get accepted. That's roughly. So maybe, maybe I'll continue. So, what fraction of them are for uh, solar system objects like this Pluto occultation that you showed? Uh, relatively few. Uh, we we have them, but um, uh, <clears throat> you know there are um, there are not so many. The, the, the really the bulk of what Sophia does is in the star formation range and so forth. Um, 
but yes, I mean, solar system uh, uh, objects, you know, if you, if you want to look at a planet, you look for whatever oxygen or you look for water on the moon or so. These are um, actually the water on the moon is now a legacy program as well. So there is, uh, there is quite some uh, time going in that. Um, proposals like the one uh, with Pluto, so these occultation observations, they are hard to do. And they, they need to be very well justified because we are not spending just the time for the occultation, which is typically just uh, you know, a few minutes or so. Um, we spend all the time in order to get in the right place. To, so you can easily spend a, a half a flight or a whole flight on this. I think in the case of the Pluto observations, we, we even moved to the east coast and and went somewhere I I, I, I wasn't there I didn't uh, see that myself but this was a, a complex uh, operation and this is why these kind of things are rare because they impact the uh, efficiency of the observatory log. Any other questions? So what's the time scale for funding? Um, well, funding is, uh, is given only to, uh, so first of all, funding happens only on the US side um, to US affiliated scientists. So for instance, if you have a, if you, if you want, you know, you, you work together with a uh, US scientist, then the the u.s side is eligible for for nasa funding um i'm i'm not quite sure about the time scales this is this is again i'm responsible for the uh, german side on the on the u.s side the uh, the funding goes through nasa and through the uh, science mission operations center and uh, that is um, that part is run by usra so they they usually give out the funding at a with a certain fee. So depending on the hours you get, you get a certain amount of funding, um, which is um, typically paid out um, a little bit before, depending on uh, the priority of the proposal, and then uh, when the data is actually arriving. Yes, so actually the question was about funding for SOFIA itself, for the telescope operations. Oh, I see. Um, so the, uh, yeah, 20% uh, of the funding is on the German side. This is for um, you know, the telescope operations. So the, uh, the overall funding, uh, I mean, the, the initial um, building of the observatory that was done jointly by uh, by the US and so NASA and DLR uh, DLR supplied supplied the telescope and the um, NASA modified the airplane and uh, now we basically have this 80 20 percent uh, division of observing time and also of funding that is provided so um, the German side, the 20% from the German side are uh, provided in terms of the team that, uh, that we um, provide for telescope operations, for some science op uh, instrument uh, operations um, and, and other things. And uh, so all this comes together and, and gives us about 20%. Um, the, in terms of overall budget per year, uh, the the U.S. side. This is always the most prominent number that uh, appears. Always um, uh, is is eighty five million. So that is the that is the budget that uh, is spent on the U.S. side, and equivalently uh, twenty percent. Uh, so roughly twenty million uh, is spent on the German side. I don't see any questions on chat. Do you have any more questions for you? Or maybe a final question. 
uh, was the efficiency of observation. So during the 10 hour flight, uh, how many hours are really used for observing the same targets? Yeah, the, um, uh, we take about an hour, a little bit less maybe for climbing to altitude and then uh, uh, setting up the telescope. Uh, and then, of course, you need also some time to, to, to descend and land again. So of the 10 hours, uh, we typically have eight hours roughly for science. That's, uh, that's the overall efficiency there. And then um, it depends on how we can plan and, and, and so forth, how, how effectively can we put sources together um, in order to, to uh, use that time. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so thank you a lot. <laughs> and we have next seminar next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, right?